Dice que sí, ¿no? Que está. So, welcome to the Mexican Cultural Institute. Um, this is our live stream, Facebook live stream. And well, I, um, the reason why we're here is it's August 13th. And we're going to talk about the, the story of La Malinche and the fall of Tenochtitlan. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for listening to this uh, conversation with a great scholar who has done a great work long, for, for a long time now on, on La Malinche. But first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about why we decided to focus on La Malinche. La Malinche is one of the enigmatic and most controversial uh, historical characters in, in one of the most epoch-shaking moments in history, which is the fall of Tenochtitlan. And, um, and here we're gonna focus on, who, like, we're gonna talk about who is La Malinche, whether we can make a clear distinction between the legend and the historical character. Um, and La Malinche in history, narrative, film, and literature has, met, has had many representations. At times, she has been portrayed as a, uh, as a traitor, sometimes as a martyr, sometimes as a lover, a starry-eyed lover, sometimes as a passive victim. And at, at times, but not as often, she, she has been portrayed as one of the most influential women in shaping the course of events that took place in the early 16th century. Um, so here we have in this conversation with Sandra Cypress, um, where we will talk about the life, times, and the representations of La Malinche the story of the fall of Tenochtitlan and how this has lived on to present times in different ways uh, that have deeply influenced Mexican culture. So I would like to first uh, introduce you to Sandra uh, Saipas. She's professor emerita of Latin American literature, and she has served as chair of the Department of Port and Portuguese at the University of Maryland, who she joined in 1994 after having been at SUNY Birmingham, uh, Bing, Binghamton University since 1976. Um, her MA was awarded from Cornell and her PhD from the University of Illinois. And her research mainly focuses on women writers, a re representation of women in Latin American literature and Latin American theater and her theoretic focus centers on feminist theory and semiotics. Um, Motivated by her doctoral work with Don Luis Leal at the University of Illinois, she has published extensively on writers from Mexico, Pia uh, Rutia, Garro Castellanos, Berman, and her book, La Malinche in Mexican Literature from History to Myth by UT Texas uh, Press from 1991, was completed after being in Mexico under the auspices of the NEH uh, Summer Fellowship, and she's considered one of the well, this book is considered one of the major pieces of scholarship on that figure, and we will talk a little bit about this um, with Sandra. She has also been invited to write the chapter on 20th century Latin American theater for the Cambridge History of Latin American Literature, and she appears on a documentary, Indigenous Ways, the Story of La Malinche and the Conquest of Mexico, which was an award-winning documentary that was broadcasted on, broadcast on national television through PBS. Um, so welcome, Sandra. It's wonderful <laughs> and it's such an honor to have you here. Uh, such a long, bright, wonderful career that you've had. And you know, you've written a lot about Alam Pinche, a very important work. Um, so first of all, I was thinking that we should maybe begin talking about how you became interested in La Malinche. Who is La Malinche? Um, I would love the audience to hear more about your work and how, why you decide to study her. What are the most fascinating aspects of her? Uh, yes, uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Marcel, and thank you to Victor Nueva Chalien for offering me this opportunity to talk about my work on one of the most important days, we might say, in, in the history of Mexico, in the beginning of what was going to become Mexico Mestizo. And I have to say that I was fortunate to have a, a Ocean, you know, so much to Mexico. I know all about the grammar, but I couldn't really speak, and I came back speaking like a Chilanda. But it was really in, at Illinois when I worked with Don Luis Leal that I began to focus on um, Mexican literature. And my first encounter with La Malinche was in a graduate course 
about Bernal Diaz de Castillo and other cronistas. And I learned from Bernal what an important woman this Doña Marino was. I mean, he gave a very uh, positive uh, idea of who she was, a beautiful woman, of course, she had to be beautiful, a princess, you know, all the positive things that were important for the Eurocentric perspective. And we'll talk a little bit more about what he really said about her. But it was interesting that after that, a uh, few semesters later, Don Luis introduced us to the Labyrinth of Solitude. And sure enough, Los Hijos de la Malinche, or as it's translated, the Sons of Malinche, was Octavio Paz's compendium of what Malinche was at that point in time, 1950. What did Malinche represent? And suddenly there was a very different perspective of who she is, right? He equates her with all these negative stereotypes, la chingada, you know, la, and la chingada again is a very strong term. And I remember that when I was um, working with Don Luis, he was really reacting to that word still. It was a very strong word in his vocabulary. <laughs> So she, he became almost embarrassed to use this word. And so I began to really get the idea that there is quite a story behind this woman and how she is represented. And so it was Octavio Paz who introduced me to the new vision of her that was not the Spanish vision. And I think after that, I was really uh, in, introduced to another aspect of her after graduate school when I began to read the work of Elena Garro. You know, in those days, there were very few women writers on our list, but I, as head scholar and a professor, I read Los Recuerdos del Porvenir, the recollections of things to come. And I was very intrigued by the fact that her characters, her woman character, was the mistress and supposed lover of the conquering hero who'd come into the town of Ixipa. And whatever they said about her, she was blamed for everything, this character, Julia. So the novel ostensibly is about the Crucero Rebellion, which is another important historical event in Mexico in the 1920s. But I felt that there was a subtext there that was talking about Malinche. What it came to be when I wrote my book was what I call the Malinche paradigm, that she related all these negative characteristics of Malinche, the woman who is the loose woman, you know, who has lovers, who is uh, opening herself up to the conqueror, who is blamed for everything. So even though she was not openly talking about Malinche and the conquest, I felt that that was the subtext in her work. And then the gem of the short story by Garro, which is Los, uh, Las Culpa es de los Tlaxcaltecas, was again the uh, deciding factor in my pursuit of Malinche through the centuries. Because here, the story is about a woman, Laura, who I feel is an avatar of La Malinche, and how she lives in the 20th century and then also in the conquest period. Garo is known for her magical realism and her ability, you know, to go through different time periods in one story. I, I think we need to, I think they're saying in Facebook that we need to adjust a little bit more. Okay, is that, you can hear me better now? Yeah, so it, it, I, apparently it's a little bit spotty, but. Oh, just, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so in La, in La Cruz de los Tlaxcaltecas, the fault is for the Tlaxcalas, she is quoting the name of one of the very important allies mm -hmm. of Cortez in that story. And so what I felt was, again, this was confirmation for me that what Garro was doing was in dialogue with the hijos de la Mal Malinche by Octavio Paz. Paz and Garro, as you know, had been married once and had a contemporary mm -hmm. experience. But I thought that Garro was trying to give a different view of what Malinche could be. In a sense, we talk about Malinche not having choices, perhaps, in, in, through the centuries. What did she do? Well, she was a slave at the time that she was first given to Cortes. Right. And so for us, reading the story of Garro, we see that she was trying to give Malinche a choice to reject 
the Eurocentric patriarchal figure of her husband who represented that culture, and she goes back to an indigenous husband. So here again, it's uh, in a sense saying, well, Malinche could have made choices had she been given opportunities. She could have yeah. done other things. And that started me on the journey to look at what I call from history to myth. What do the chronicles say about her? And then how was she interpreted through the centuries? And basically we know that images and metaphors and myths, the whole of symbolic activity reflect a particular reality. But also very importantly, these images and the whole idea of myths structure our experiences. That is, they can influence practices and behavior. And so you have the idea that the Malinche Cortez relationship is a root paradigm, as as Kaf calls it, then what does this mean about male-female relations in Mexico? What does it mean about also ethnic relations? Is it that Malinche, as the submissive woman, is meant to uh, be dominated to the Eurocentric tradition? So I think that what we have to understand is that these positions, and as I explain in the book, these ideas are not so much historical reality, but today, in a sense, it is that they're ideologically driven. I could not say with assurance while I was reading all these texts that we knew what the true history was, especially in those days when I was writing in 1991. And so I couldn't worry about the reality that really happened. But what I did do is try to show why the writers were trying to think of Malinche in a certain way. And that is what I felt was very important. And even today, now, there's so much more new information that we can revise the myths that we were taught, the history. I think that in a way, my new title would be a Malinche in Mexican literature from history in quotes to myth and back to history. Because today we have so much more information. People have actually studied Nahuatl and have looked at the annals that the indigenous peoples you know, presented to us. And the new historical reality is very different from what we were told as the story of the conquest. And I think that's what I was trying to do in my work. I think that's, that's, that's wonderful. Um that your, your, your uh, academic and writer's journey was also linked to this wonderful journey that you're mentioning uh, from myth and legend to history. So um, I would just like to, um, to move on now to the, to the historical aspect. Yes. To maybe talk about the life and times of La Malinche. Who was La Malinche in historical terms? Um, what was the perspective of Native Americans about La Malinche? Um, and it seems like the well, Mesoamerican um, civilization then, we have the Aztecs, which can be seen as almost the last empire that was produced mm -hmm. by the Mesoamerican mm -hmm. civilization. But before that, we have a very complex society. So could you talk a little bit more about this world that La Malinche was born in and grew up and was raised in? Sure. I think it's interesting because when I was taught about the conquest, it was that maybe 600 brave Spanish soldiers came in and conquered this country, the Aztec Empire. But the reality is that before they came, this was a very complex Mesoamerican community. There were many different indigenous groups. Not all were Aztec, not all were Nahuatl speakers. And so the idea is that there were, we only see Aztec and Maya, but there were Olmecas, Oltecas, as well as Aztec and Maya, and many more, and, and many more. Uh, uh, and Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, who is a well-known anthropologist, says that when the Spaniards arrived, the Aztecs ruled over 370 small city-states that paid tribute to them, to Tenochtitlan, the capital of the empire. So we are talking about a Mesoamerican area that had many different city-states, many different languages, and the ruling uh, Maya on one hand and the Aztec on the other, yes. But the Aztecs at that moment were a mighty empire. 
with a complex society. And how they ruled all these different city-states was based on wars. And then once they uh, conquered a particular city-state, they extracted tribute from them. So I think this is the important thing to see that this was a very complex society. And La Malinche was born into one of those city-states. Her father, it is said, was a cacique, a, an important tribal leader. And when he died, it was said too, this is part of the things that we think happened, that her mother remarried and then she was sold into slavery. So rather than calling her an Aztec princess, this is one of the myths that she was an Aztec princess, rather than calling her an Aztec princess, she was really part of a city state. So again, we start right away knowing that she was not part of the Aztec world. But she did learn Nahuatl, we assume, because that city-state spoke Nahuatl. And she might have learned as a daughter of a chieftain the high Nahuatl language. This is all assumed, and I, I think we can say that that's probably true. When she was sold into slavery, she wound up in 1519 with the uh, Tabascans, you know, the Totonaco tribe, where the, the encuentro occurred, the mixed case. She was given Cortes as one of 20 women as a tribute because Cortes had a battle with the Totonacos and he won. And when they began to talk to each other, the Totonacos and Cortes, by means of a very interesting system of translation, I have to back up a little and say that how Cortes was able to deal with these. Now, with the Maya speakers was that along the way, when he arrived in Mexico, in, in the Yucatan, he came across Jerónimo de Aguilar, who was a soldier who had come before and had been shipwrecked and had lived among the Maya for almost eight years, they say. And so he knew the language of the Maya and he was willing to come along with Cortes to serve as his translator. So we have Cortes speaking to the chief Otonacos by means of Jerónimo de Aguilar. And Malinche was one of those women. Now, the Spanish had the idea, and now here we see possibility what a vision of her might have looked like. And according to Bernal Diaz, the Spanish chronicler, she was a very beautiful woman and was attractive. And, and at first, Cortes gave her to the um, most important noble. But when he found out that she had other talents other than being beautiful, he realized that she should be part of his retinue. And what happened was that the Totonacos told him that they were very disgruntled with the Aztecs, with their imposition of tributes and war. And so Cortes began to understand that there was a rivalry among all these tribes, that not everyone was accepting the Aztec Empire as their uh, ruler, if they could. If they could perhaps uh, have independence. And Cortes said, yes, if you ally yourself with me, I will give you freedom. I will give you freedom from those tributes. And that is, in a sense, what was happening. And so it is said, too, that uh, at one point, Malinche, this young woman, who was called at this point Marina, but during her baptism, because the Spanish baptized all these young women, he found out that she could not only speak Maya, but also Nahuatl. And that was the beginning of her relationship. And uh, the uh, secretary of Cortes, Lopez de Gama Gomera, states in his chronicle, that Cortes promised her her freedom if she would help him in translation. So let's remember that, that she was a slave. She had been supposedly a princess, sold into slavery by her own family, and now she was allied with Cortes. Is she a real figure? Yes, she's a real figure because we see here in the Lienzo de Tlaxcala, the Tlaxcalan tribes produced this pictograph we see how important she became because she's at the side of Cortes in his meeting with Moctezuma. 
and look at the figure in a way how she is almost a little taller than Cortez and she and he pointing in the same way you see that she is reflecting her close relationship with Cortez. One thing that's different, she is wearing the garb of the Tlaxcalans, even though she is not part of the Tlaxcala group, but she is also not wearing sandals. If you see all the indigenous people are wearing sandals, she is wearing shoes that show her as a synthetic figure in a way. She has the, the, the hair and the, the costume of an indigenous woman, but she's wearing Spanish style shoes. It's very interesting. But we see here too, that when her name was given to her as Marina, it had a strange transformation. We're talking about syncretism now in her garb, but there is syncretism also in her name. When I started working on a Malinche, she was called as a birth name, Malinali. And now we discovered that that could not be true. Um, scholars like uh, Francis Bartunin and Camila Townsend and um, other writers have now looked at the annals and said, we don't know her birth name. What happened is that she was baptized Marina. And within the Nahuatl lexicon, they don't hear the R, but they hear an L. So Marina became Malina. And Malina became Malinsin. Malinsin is the honorific in Nahuatl. So it shows too that the indigenous people gave her honor, just as she was called by the Spanish, not only Marina, but Doña Marina. Malincin is almost a translation of Doña Marina. And Malincin in the Spanish ear sounded like Malinche. And so I have used the word Malinche, not so much Marina, because I think Malinche is the syncretic name. And we, in other words, I had to change a lot of my own book and a lot of the things you see on the internet to keep on repeating that Malin, Malinali was her birth name. We now feel that no, Marina was the name we get to know her by. And it was by means of all these translations with different languages that she was Malincin and Malinche. And she is La Malinche because very interestingly, through the annals, we find out that the indigenous people called him El Malinche. So close were they. And this may be one of the first times that a male figure is given the name from the female. <laughs> so I think it's important to keep Malinche as the way we talk about her. When people say Doña Marina, we know that they are looking at her from a Spanish perspective, from the Eurocentric perspective. Malinche is also a name that is used and I would use that as well. But I think for me, in a sense, to remind us of the fact that he was an important figure with Cortes in being a translator through all this series. And I think myself, we were talking about how uh, it's almost like the old game of telephone where if someone spoke in Nahuatl, Malinche translated it into Maya and then from Maya, and anymore the Aguilar translated it into Spanish. And one of the things that is fascinating about her is that very soon she learns Spanish. Now, as a professor of Spanish, I'm amazed that someone could learn so quickly. I wish my student had been like that, but she is evidently a woman who's so intelligent and um, perspicacious, perspicacious that she was able to soon not have to use Jeronimo de Aguilar. She was able to go from Nahuatl to Spanish, Maya to Spanish. And so again, we see that she must have been a very intelligent woman, which is often uh, ignored in the fact that she's uh, viewed in so many other ways that sort of miss out on all the things that she was able to do for the Spanish. Now, if you want to speak about the fact that she might have been uh, called a traitor for that reason, or shall we get into that now, the, the negatives? Right. Um, and, and thank you. Yeah, that, that was a wonder, wonderful explanation of the, the, the world that, uh, uh, that emerged out of uh, La Malinche, especially when, when, 
when the first contact began with, <laughs> between Cortes and the Mesoamerican world. And I just only wanted to add there something that about how this, like as Ilya Klindin and this wonderful anthropologist who wrote on, on the Aztecs and also all of Tenochtitlan, how this Aztec empire was not an Aztec monolith as many Europeans have it. And she, she even says that this is just a European hallucination, that this was more of a more of an atomistic polity that was held together by the tension of mutual repulsion between all these different city-states. And I think within that world, that's when we can start uh, bringing in the, the idea of the traitor, which is very uh, yes, yeah. important there. Um, so, so, so one of the questions um, here is, what happens and how does the world change when Cortes and his men may well, they, they, they make landfall in the, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the Caribbean and all the Indies, and then they eventually end up in Yucatan. And then from there, they eventually, as, as you said, end up and with, the, with the making first contact with the Totonacs. And that, that sort of spreads the news to, to Tenochtitlan that they're on their way. So yeah. you've talked a little bit about the role of her being la lengua and, and the translator and this very quick transition from a very complicated lost in translation situation <laughs> with Jerónimo de Aguilar uh, into the sole translator. So when does, when, does the, when does the traitor, the idea of a traitor um, come in into the, into the story, uh, yeah. especially in the situation where you have, um, where you have many different War in factions and, and mm -hmm. tensions within the uh, Aztec polity. Yeah. What's, what's the role of, Man of Malinche? Right. It's interesting in this um, view we have of the Codex right now, you see that Malinche is the only woman in all of the picture, right? And again, being a woman she, and being a translator, she was uh, transgressing all the taboos. You know, the Moctezuma's title, we say emperor, but he was also called the Tlatoani, which means he who speaks. And so he was the person who speaks. And when you saw him, you had to be submissive and um, lower your eyes. And she is often seen in other, uh, other examples of pictographs of looking straight ahead at Moctezuma. And of course, also for Cortez, there aren't many women who had the role of being such an important figure and being a spokesperson. So she was breaking a lot of taboos. And once you break taboos, you know, you're open for a lot of, um, what shall we say, um, criticism in a sense. And so all during the period of the conquest, she was not considered a negative figure. They held her in awe as we see by her title of Doña Marina, and also Malinsin. When we come to 1821, interesting, 300 years later, when Mexico was able to achieve its political independence from Spain, the nationalists, the people who were now looking at their past, revised these myths, revised what they thought about Malinche. It was here we see the exchange, right? Cortes and La Malinche, there she is. Her, her face is almost covered by Cortes in a way because this, this um, vision of Diego de Rivera very well expresses what Cortes expressed in his letters to the king. He only mentions Malinche two times. One as La Lengua in letter two, and then he tells the king, oh yes, Marina. He mentions her name in letter five. But if we only had Cortes's vision of her, we wouldn't know anything about Malinche. It's really Fernal Diaz who gives us the, the high idea of what she was in, in relation to their enterprise. And if you look at the quote that we have about Fernal Diaz, he narrates that he calls her, she had shown herself to be such an excellent woman and fine interpreter throughout the wars in New Spain, Tlaxcala. And I shall show you, Cortes always took her with him. And then he says that she met her mother and her stepbrother along the way when they were on their route. And this is what she said to them. 
that she didn't hold any vengeance on them for selling her, but God had been very gracious to her in freeing her from the worship of idols and making her a Christian and letting her bear a son to her Lord and master Cortes and in marrying her to such a gentleman as Juan Jaramillo, which Cortes did. He um, allowed her to marry another conquistador. He was her husband and that she would rather serve her husband in Cortes than anything else in the world and would not exchange her place to her casica, to be casica of all the provinces in New Spain. Well, do we know that she really said this? If she were speaking in Nahuatl, did Bernal Diaz know what she said? What he does here, beyond the reality of what he heard, is what he was trying to present as the portrait of the good colonial subject. This is how I read it. And so, she was the good colonial subject for the Spanish at that time. So what happens when Mexico goes into the Anyone who's a good colonial subject, the person who's a good colonial subject. I think, I think if you lean, lean back a little bit with the- uh, Oh, okay. Because if not, it gets a little bit spot. Oh, sorry. When I move around, I know when I move around. <laughs> doesn't, sorry. Doesn't hear me. Sorry okay. So Bernal, for Bernal Diaz, She's the good colonial subject. Then the nationalists from 1821 onward look at this good colonial Spanish subject and say, oh no, she is the vende patria. She sold our country out to the Spanish. And as I have been saying beforehand, her patria, there was no patria. How can we use the word patria at a time when there had been over 360 or 70 small city states. She was not an Aztec. And so the idea that she sold her patria out to the Spanish is not historically accurate. Many of the Spanish um, soldiers came, yes, but more were fighting the Aztecs with the Spanish. And for some, Mexican historians, it was really a, a, a liminal moment in which the Totonacos, the Tlaxcaltecas, and other tribes, uh, other indigenous, I won't call them tribes, other indigenous peoples decided this was the time that they could conquer the Aztec Empire and free themselves of the wars and free themselves of all the tributes they had to pay to the Aztecs. So the historical reality would be that she wasn't being a traitor in her actions. But for the nationals, this was a way of talking about what she, what someone was to blame. She acted as the scapegoat for the idea. And also there was a, an erasure of the individualities of all these different city states. The Aztecs were seen as the major force in Mesoamerica, but that wasn't true. Unfortunately, of course, as we know, the Spanish did not seem to um, hold to the idea that they would give the freedom to the other tribes because the other indigenous uh, peoples. That is true. But what Malinche did was not a traitorous act. And I hold that as a reality. But what was interesting, too, is that she and Cortes were called the um, Adam and Eve of the Mexican people. In, other, in the creation of the uh, Mestizo country. Now, you will read uh, many on Google uh, sites that their child, they had a child together, my team was that, that he was the first Mestizo, which of course isn't true historically, since I'm sure that as soon as the Spanish came to the Yucatan, and we know that Gonzalo Guerrero, another of the um, soldiers who was with Jeronimo de Aguilar, had a Maya wife and had children before Cortes and Malinche. But Mexico, in my study, seems to be the only country that has taken the biblical image of Adam and Eve as their founding couple. And this is, in a sense, what we see here with the mural, Cortes y la Malinche, where you see the whiteness of Cortes, the Eurocentric vision. And you see the very strong indigenous perspective of La Malinche as Eve. And so 
what this represents in a way, and I see on the bottom there is a figure perhaps of an indigenous, that's what one of the interpretations are, that from the indigenous, Cortes and Malinche come together to form the Mestizo Nation. And Mexico is really, interestingly enough, the one who has this orig originary couple as their creation for the uh, Mestizo state. And I think that, uh, again, Eve in the nationalist vision was the one who let in the serpent to the Garden of Eden, you know? And so La Malinche is one who lets in the serpent. Cortes is now not only Adam, but also the serpent who mm -hmm. has brought um, all these people in. Now, for the longest time, that was the negative image. But we see here a, a painting by Santa Barraza, a Chicana. And for me, she is in dialogue with Orozco. Just like Garro was in dialogue with us, I feel that she is recreating the image of Adam and Eve, but because we see here too the idea of being in a garden. And so that's what allows me to see her as uh, La Eva Mexicana. And we see Cortes, but he's in the background and she is in the forefront of the scene. And it sort of shows you the horses with which the Spanish came and brought to the Mesoamerican area. You see the idea of um, in you know people being um, hung and people being uh, attacked, but in the middle, in the forefront is the figure of La Malinche. So she's not saying that everything was perfect about her actions, but she is trying to show her as a, an important figure for the idea of so now it seems that we, we've been talking a lot about a lot of myths. I, I don't think you have to hold the, um, <laughs> as long as, I think as long as, yeah, I think if you, the, the, the closer you get to the to the screen, that's when we, okay. we can hear so well. But yeah, yeah, I don't want you to be. Okay. <laughs> um, but you, were, you were talking about this um, fascinating aspect of all the myths, not, not, not just surrounding La Malinche and the figure, but also about the, the, the fall of Tenochtitlan. Ah, yes. um, and it was very interesting here and how that connects to the narrative, uh, the nationalist narrative. And, and here we have ah, yes. Roberto Cueva del Rio depicting uh, Cortés <laughs> with La Malinche and Cortés, of course, being seen as a, as a, 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 as a god, the announced god. Yes. And of course, Moctezuma believing completely uh, omen driven person uh, that, that he was a god. So I wanted to maybe talk a little bit more about the myths that were feeding into yeah. the nationalist narrative, not just about Tenochtitlan, not, not just about La Malinche, but also about the fall of Tenochtitlan. Um, right. And here we have, you know, Prescott, who in the, the American, American, William Prescott in the 19th century. Um, he wrote the history of the conquest of Mexico mm -hmm. in 1843. Uh, some of them have, have even called it a fable, the fable, the fable of, uh, of Prescott. Um, you know, the, the, the few hundred brave Spanish men, as you were mentioning, entering yes. uh, yeah. the monolithic Aztec empire and bringing an entire empire to, 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 to their feet. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what you were mentioning here a little bit is, how can we make sense of the fall of Tenochtitlan? So the, the, those 11 months from, from the moment Cortes arrives and, mm -hmm. founds, uh, and, and founds a Poza Rique Veracruz, which is this legalist, legalistic way of, uh, of justifying to the crown that he's not being just this buccaneer, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, escaping from, from Velázquez until the siege of Tenochtitlan and the complete destruction, how can we make sense um, of these 11 months and the role that La Malinche has in maybe trying to prolong a situation that could have, that, that was inevitably leading to a civil war. Some of them have called it, uh, you know, this, this is not just a conquest of Tenochtitlan, but, uh, but a brutal Mesoamerican civil war emerging. Uh, out of the Spanish arriving. So I just wanted to, to ask you, like, how, how are all of these myths 
of La Malinche and the conquest of the world for this, influencing not just the narrative of the nationalists, but further narrative, but other narratives that, it, that, that uh, came after. Yeah. Um, I think with Prescott, we learned what the Eurocentric perspective was on this conquest, that there was one great man, the great man theory, and it was Cortes, and he was able to conquer them because of his astuteness and strategic powers. But what we must remember, that's a myth because what was going on at that time was yes, the Spanish did bring their horses and did have guns and cannons, but they brought with them also an invisible invader. And we can appreciate that very much. We're suffering with coronavirus pandemic. Well, there was a smallpox and, and epidemic going on with the Spanish conquest. And I think that that was also a very important important part of their ability to conquer the Aztecs because of the nature of how they did warfare. They were, had a very stylized form of warfare. Moctezuma uh, soon lost his battle with Cortes in a way. He didn't kill him outright because that wasn't the way the Aztecs did it. They took prisoners and then they would sacrifice the prisoners. So he didn't kill Cortes and it was too late because Cortes was able to imprison him. And we don't know with clarity that he, yet Moctezuma was killed or he died. We're not sure how it happened. But what Kitikuitloa was immediately put in as the next Lakawani, and he died within a week of smallpox. And so Kualtemo came. So there was disarray among the, the Aztecs at that moment of time when they could have been trying to conquer the Spanish. So we have the idea that there were many indigenous allies for the Spanish. The indigenous peoples wanted to conquer the Aztecs for all the reasons I've mentioned. And then we have an epidemic going on. So in a sense, there are so many reasons why the, um, in that 11 months, while Temo as leader could not overcome the forces of the Spanish with the Tlaxcaltecas and the other indigenous people. The annals tell us, and the historians have been able to find out that in a way, Malinche was trying to attenuate the situation. She had tried to work to avoid an out and out conflict. And this again has been sort of erased from the popular imagination. So, so much is erased from the popular imagination of what took place. And I think it's important for us today at this point in thinking over what must have been going on is that yes, she played a crucial role in communicating between the Spanish and the indigenous without doubt. But what were her choices? How could she have said no, let's say to the conqueror and said, no, I, I don't want to accept this role. <laughs> but she was promised freedom. And so she was trying to work a way to um, perhaps conquer the uh, force of the Aztecs, a situation in which, oh dear, I, I, I moved too much when I speak and I lost my piece. <laughs> ha, bueno. No, it's, it's okay. Um, can you see no, me? Okay, can... so this is what happened. I believe, and not only, I believe it on the basis of what I've learned from various historians, that she had been really trying to um, attenuate the, the terrible battle, but somehow or other also control the Aztecs, but it didn't work that way. She could not control completely the situation. So, well, the, 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 that's a very interesting, one, one of the interpretations and re representations that has emerged about La Malinche, which is she was, most scholars focusing on the different choices and possibilities that she had, but also giving her the agency and the role that she actually had in shaping the course of events during those very important months that led to the siege of Tenochtitlan. She, 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 she was, she could have been, uh, you know, prolonging this, 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 this situation to avoid war and to avoid the civil war. Yes. But um, if we move now from, from the from the history, from the historical character to the many 
representations, which uh, your work has, has been wonderful because you've explored so many different representations of La Malinche, which up to date keep on moving. And as, yes. as you mentioned, this is like a palimpsest, that La Malinche is like a palimpsest that you should explore all its different, um, yes. all its different images and representations. We can maybe start talking about how, how she's been interpreted as La Madre Mestizaje. We talked a little bit about that, yes. about La Lengua. Let's um, look at what other image. representations do we have? Yeah, we can look at some of the other images that mm -hmm. we've selected, mm -hmm. which will be, we should mention too, that a lot of these images will appear in the uh, Denver Museum's first ever representation of La Malinche as a figure. And that will occur, it was supposed to be in 2021, but because of the pandemic, of course, it's, uh, it's postponed to 2022. But we'll be right before to the romantic view of her, uh, I want to talk a little bit about this. This image is is iconic. I even have here the same one in a folletin, uh, you know, a, a popular uh, magazine image of La Malinche. And this is what most of the um, let's say from the, in post um, past period, Octavio Paz, he says she gave herself voluntarily to Cortez. And of course we know, and, and we assume that she's in love with this man, but we cannot really use the term love in the 16th century in the same way. We cannot ignore the fact that she was slave at this moment. So this image of her is a, a, a pure fabrication. And the whole idea of having Malinche fall in love with uh, Cortez or with Juan Paradillo is just out of context for that period. And I think Federico Navarrete, who is the historian at the UNAM and who has uh, uh, directed the Noti Conquista, which is now being shown every week in Mexico about the conquest, tries to also uh, sort of shoot down this myth. How can we talk about love? But yet this is an image that proliferated everywhere about Malinche and Cortes. And then we see a Chicana version of it, I think, we're, we're trying to popularize it. The next one you could show about this, is, again, in dialogue. I find it fascinating that uh, even though Malinche never was able to write her own thoughts down, we have many dialogues of the people who talk about her. We have the Eurocentric masculine perspective, and then as the uh, feminists come into the uh, discourse, they critique you, just as Carraza did with Orozco, Garra with us. Now we hear Maria Cristina Cabrera showing us that stylized romantic image. And notice that Malinche in this version does not look at Cortez, she's looking out. And I guess you, know, you can say so much about what this must mean. That Malinche, yes, she had very few choices. She was a slave. He gave her the opportunity to be free. So she took it, showing her resilience, showing her intelligence at a crucial moment in her life. Let's look out, let's see what she can accomplish. And I think that's what this image of Malinche is commenting on, the irony of the thought that she is looking at the test. And a number of the Mexican uh, dramatists, uh, Elena, uh, not only Elena Garo writing, but Rosario Castellano as El Eterno Femenino, the Eternal Feminine, Sabina German with uh, Aguila Oso, where they show how Malinche manipulated Cortez because she knew she had to figure out a way to get him to help her in her uh, fight against the Aztecs. But of course, we know the results of that. But nevertheless, we should say that she was attempting to keep her freedom and help also the indigenous people. So I think that this is so interesting how we can see these various uh, dialogues going on even today about her. And we can move on to a couple of images. Um, we still have time. Yeah, we still okay. have time just to wrap up with the different representations because I, yeah. I, I really want you to talk about the, the, the recent Chicana movement and um, feminist movement, how, oh, yes. how they've re right. reinterpreted La Malinche uh, recently. Right. I, I've been, um, I updated my Malinche book for the Spanish 
recession in, uh, that hopefully will come out at the end of 2021. And what's so interesting is how the Chicanas are looking at her and seeing her as a sister in a sense, a bridge figure as they are negotiating different cultures. And we have these very, this image of her as being two-faced, you know, and um, not, you know, being a traitor in a sense has been a, a recon, revisioned by the Chicanas. And Lucha Corfi has a very interesting novel about uh, the avatar of Malinche, Black Widow's wardrobe. And she has her character say, well, you know, doing research on Malinche, I see how she has been mishandled in a way, I'm paraphrasing, how she has been mishandled by all these male writers. And the uh, Chicanas like um, Norma Alarcón have been trying to revision her, Alicia Gaspar de Alba. And they say that in a sense, I think we can go to the last one perhaps, that she could almost be considered a lesbian in the way they would like to interpret that. Not in her sexual activity, but as a woman who is trying to um, go against taboo and the heterosexist vision of her. So it's a very interesting and thought provoking idea about what the Chicanas are doing with her, recognizing her in their similarity as bridge figures. And Alicia Gaspar de Alba has said, let's not call her a vende patria, let's call her an abre camino, that she was opening up um, ways, new ways. And I think Cecilia Alvarez here, she has one that says, Malinche had her reasons. Suddenly, we're not talking about what the nationalists thought of her, what Bernal Diaz thought of her. We're not talking about the visions of different people, how they have imposed their ideology on her as a layers of this palimpsest of this figure. But here, this is Malinche as the human being who had reasons as a slave, as a person in a liminal position to do what she had to do. And I think it reminds us of her humanity. You know, I've studied her as a representation, as an icon, as the, you know, Mexican Eve, or and there are even people who call the Mexican Mejia as a Yorona figure who has killed her children. Again, all symbolic and not historically related. But we come back to the idea of the real woman now. And I believe that that's the important thing that we should know, that this was a liminal moment in Mexican history a woman was involved in it. She had her reasons. But she isn't a scapegoat. She isn't this romantic figure in love with Eurocentric um, males. She had to do what she could do to survive. And I think that's the message that there are so many myths. Don't believe the myths. Try to find out the reality beneath it all. I think that's, that's uh, I really like how you how you end that um, one of those last. <laughs> Uh, reinterpretations and representations of La Malinche, which is, yeah. which also brings the question of how can we go against certain myths, even no matter how many historical facts, how many books can be published on La Malinche. Yeah. It's, it's always hard to go against a certain myth. So yeah. what, what's interesting here is that it sort of new narratives that some of them, as, as we were talking, have been there since you've been started working in La Malinche yeah. in the 1970s, 1980s, have been there, but all of a sudden, these narratives become much more popularized, uh, mm -hmm. and, and people really start listening to these narratives and, and, and recovering them from, uh, from from previous generations. So I think there's also a generational aspect here yes. that yeah. we could explore. Um, mm -hmm. There's this uh, there's a scholar. His name is Ashley Smith. Uh, I was talking to him at some point, and apparently he interviewed a, a lot of people, and he realized that there's like a difference between generations right now on, on, oh, the, oh. on the interpretations about La Malinche. So, yeah. um, so it's wonderful that your your work um, is this updated, new. Um, <laughs> we should we should announce that now that your uh, your your chapter that you wrote many years ago now is going to be republished, right? Yes. Um, yes. Right. <laughs> um, including new interpretations. Um, yes, I mean, Malinche has become a global figure in addition as a metaphor. That's what's so interesting that there is, for example, a play by a Chilean woman 
in Estranga called Malinche. Mm -hmm. That's the only realistic motif in the whole play. And what she's done is use Malinche's paradigm as a subject to talk about women oppression in a war. And so the play could be Chile, it could be any, any country, any group of women who are oppressed and who are trying to fight the dominating force in their lives. And so I thought that was an amazing use of the figure of Malinche, not so much as a real person, but what she has come to mean. And sometimes it's negative. I was reading also that in Venezuelan films, they use Malinche, oh, not the, the indigenous woman who helped the uh, conqueror is the Malinche, but other women are not. And so you see the negatives also and the positives. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm receiving a lot of uh, comments here that uh, oh. congratulations, bravo y abrazos, and what a wonderful presentation. And um, I, joined, I joined those, uh, uh, todas esas felicitaciones. We were <laughs> so happy to have you here. Oh. Um, and I, I don't know, we can have maybe a couple of uh, questions from the audience, or um, yeah. if we, if not, we can add on, on a couple of more um, representations because this, the, 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 it just keeps on going. <laughs> it's a fascinating figure. I mean, I, 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 I'm amazed at the global impact that she has had as a, an icon, mm -hmm. and uh, too many of the stories are about the love interest. You know, this is what people seem to want to say about Alinche and Cortez, the great love affair. And they forget. I mean, Margot Glanz has tried to remind us that she seems to be like this ambassador at large in her ability to handle all the sophisticated talk between the two conquerors, between Cortez and Moctezuma. We can't forget, you know, this was a, a very um, conflictive time. Things were changing. And here she was able to negotiate and able to survive, you know, and I think that that's important. And, and just sort of um, basically say it's just a love story. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I have, a, I have one last question before saying goodbye to the audience. And um, would I would love to continue the, the conversation, but how do you see in the future uh, the next representations or in this, ah. how is this palimpsest going to change over the future? <laughs> well, um, again, yeah, I mean, there are so many elements to what I call the Malinche paradigm. And again, as you said, it's generational. Mm -hmm. What will the next generation feel is important? What resonates with them? Perhaps for the nationalists, it was, well, we have a safe boat. Let's blame it on the woman. Then other people said, oh, no, we, you know, here's a woman who is so resilient and intelligent. Let's think of her as a translator. Let's think of her as a negotiator. And maybe as more women become presidents and uh, are engaged in political strategy, they'll say, ah, Malinche is our uh, hero, heroine, whatever. And I know that she is on a, uh, a T-shirt for the um, American Translators Association as the first translator of the Americas, a first woman translator. So I think. I'm having hope that with people who have more enlightened views and a more feminist perspective, that we will continue to, to negotiate what she was in a time period and understand her as a unique figure at a very conflictive, traumatic moment in time. Thank you so much, Sandra, and thank you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, so thank much you so to much say. for everyone. There's say. always so much to say. There's so much to say. It was, <laughs> and uh, well, this is this was Professor Emerita Sandra Seifes, and as always, it's been a pleasure having you here, at the Mexican Cultural Institute and the, of the Mexican Embassy, the Embassy of Mexico, um, and Marcela Luisa, also a historian here. Um, it was wonderful, wonderful having this chat. Well, hope to see you very soon, and let's let, let's hope that that. Um, that future of La Malinche is what's yes. actually happened. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure too. Thank you. <laughs>